Can you guys hear us? Okay, apparently uh, apparently we just now went live, so let's start over. Welcome to Conflict Radio. Greetings. Today is March 15th, 2021. We have Jared Murphy joining us. How are you, Jared? I am doing great. Thanks for having me on. All right. It's good to have you on. And for our guest today, we've got Brad Olson. He's the author of 10 books, including three in his esoteric series, Modern Esoteric, Future Esoteric, and the newly released Beyond Esoteric an award-winning author, book publisher, and event producer. His keynote presentations and interviews have enlightened audiences at Contact in the Desert, UFO Mega Conference, the 5D events, and dozens of radio shows, including Coast to Coast AM, Ground Zero, and Fade to Black. Welcome to Conflict Radio. Brad Olson, how are you? Hey, it's great to be here. I'm doing just fine. Thanks for having me on again. <laughs> yeah, man, it's, uh, it's great that you're joining us. want to give a shout-out to everybody in the chat room. Uh, Mr. Fox, it looks like Blue Chicken's in here somewhere, maybe, Ivan, and uh, I guess that's uh, all we've got in here so far. Uh, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. Brad, we wanted to get you on to talk about, I mean, you've been to Antarctica, right? You've been down there. How awesome was that? I came back a year and two months ago, so pretty fairly recently. Yeah, so uh, it's fresh in your memory. That's awesome. We wanted to talk to you a little bit about Admiral Byrd and what you thought of that diary. But first, uh, let's give a shout out to Jared Murphy, who's who's joining us. Jared, how's your day been? What do you got going on? Anything new? Uh, no, classic Minnesota. It's psychotic, and we went from sixty degrees to now freezing and it's snowing. So it's a, um, it's I believe it's similar to where it is permanently where you're at, at least for skiing, right, Brad? I'm out on the coast uh, in California. It's pretty tempered out here. Oh, that's still better than, yeah, we, we had green grass and now we're back to winter again, but that's Minnesota, at least until April at the end yeah. here. Yeah, that's a common Minnesota weather, I suppose. It's only March. You're going to still get snow. I, I was up in, uh, I remember I lived in the Panhandle in Nebraska there for a while. And geez, man, it was like snowing in May. <sighs> Uh, it, it can do some really – and then, of course, we get 100% humidity and 90 degrees. So if you want to train for tropical work, uh, mountaineering, or just complete Arctic uh, Wim Hof stuff, you can do that here. That's pretty awesome. We actually got the stream going on time today. It's surprising. So, Brad, I guess tell us a little bit about your books, and, and then we'll dive into Antarctica a little bit. Well, sure. Uh, you mentioned the three in the esoteric series. That's what I've been – focused on for the better part of the last decade first two came out pretty concurrently with each other around 2012 and they've since been in second editions and audiobooks and that's modern esoteric beyond our senses and future esoteric the unseen realms then i've been working on the third and final in the installation beyond prison planet uh Beyond Esoteric, Escaping Prison Planet, for the better part of uh, six years now. And this book contains my information on Antarctica and a whole lot more. That I use the word Beyond Esoteric because it can be thought of as this goes way beyond what any 19th century occultist could imagine the world that we're living in today. And in some ways, it's 1984 on steroids. In other ways, it's uh, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, where everybody's just indoctrinated on entertainment and media. Uh, but the few that get it, well, that's the definition of the word esoteric. It's information that's known by a select few. In fact, when the word changes, when enough people start to change that subject by knowing about it, so when everybody begins to understand something, it becomes exoteric and not quite as interesting anymore. Well, it's still common knowledge, but uh, I like these subjects because to me it gives an explanation about a lot of things, including the ET realms, including what's going on in the world today and where we've been a history lesson like no others. And so to know about Antarctica play, plays into this. And I, I, I'm very fortunate because I've been traveling quite a bit in my life. Uh, first started out as a travel book writer, 
And now I've been to all seven continents and uh, continue to do a lot of work, mostly uh, talking at conferences about the mystery of the megaliths of South America, for example, as well as my uh, trip down to Antarctica. The talk is called The Hidden Anomalies of Antarctica, which I'll be giving a week from, no, this weekend coming up in Las Vegas at the 5D conference, one of the very few live conferences of the year. And starting this Friday night, I'm moderating a super soldier panel, which includes Michael Jaco, James Rink, and Penny Bradley, and I think one or two others. So uh, <laughs> that takes us from where I've been to into the future, <laughs> to answer your question. All right. Now, I wanted to ask you about what you thought of the Admiral Byrd diary, and then we're going to get to uh, Jared, because Jared's been doing some research on this. And let's talk about that and, and discuss whether or not this is, this is fake or not. What do you, what do you think? Well, uh, probably Jared would have a better authority as to what the uh, audacity or the veracity of this document is. I only collect data points, guys, so I, I'm familiar with it. I've compared it to other things, most especially the big uh, reported hole near South Pole. And I could tell you for an absolute fact that there is a no-fly zone over the portion of near the South Pole up on the Antarctic Plateau, which is over two miles deep of ice down to the old plate of East Antarctica, which is part of the original Pangaea. It, it's rocks that can date over three billion years old. Whereas the part I went to is up on the Palmer Peninsula, just south of uh southern tip of South America, that is the closest connection between a continent and Antarctica. And that's where we sailed over. I went on a sailboat for uh, 26 days to get over there. And that landmass is much newer. So Admiral Byrd, he had, he founded Little America. He'd been to Antarctica many times. Of course, he was the admiral in Operation High Jump post-World War II. But he's also a very skilled uh aviator and he went far and wide in an airplane over antarctica as well as he's also an arctic explorer too and he had many firsts as an aviator so he was the first one to be really looking with a critical eye at the whole continent and if anybody were to be able to find something like this entrance to inner earth i would say the, the odds are it would have been admiral bird if such a thing exists but i think a lot of data points suggests that it does so be interested to hear jared's point on that oh i well i agree with everything you just said as far as like you said the data points you know you start collecting okay what's what are the facts and then what are the stories and then people get really it's so i mean who doesn't want to get excited about our true history and then right. and then the then the story comes up and we got Jules Verne as a reference. And then we have, oh, no, it happened to a sailor in the 1700s. And and then Admiral Byrd has this diary. And then it's it's just like I'm, I'm not a big fan of, again, having started my research on my book uh, over the course of four years, when I got into one of the earliest ones, too, is Zechariah, you know, Sitchin. And, yeah. and then it's like, okay, uh, show me the cuneiform tablets. And it's like, well, what do you mean there are none? Well, that's not possible. There's a whole database of them. So then it came to the Admiral Byrd thing. It's like, okay, high jump. Okay. Well, okay. Are we in Antarctica? Are we in the, I, I couldn't believe that the data points on the stories are what's one of the most confusing things for people to go out looking is, okay, one, one sentence they're talking about the Arctic and the North Pole. And the next sentence they're talking about Antarctica. And I'm like, am I being punked? Is this like the other sciences going on right now? I mean, how are we switching between two poles in a single sentence in a single paragraph? And I'm like, are these all misinformation blogs? Are they all, is it that necessary to throw everybody off? What's going on? So you finally sort through it all. And then, oh uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So high jump. I mean, they establish a military base. It's occupied and abandoned, I think in the seventies or early, late sixties, they abandon uh, the, the base that was set up. But other than that, and other than these, um, that uh, Richard Miller Allen accounts uh, being with Bird and in an open pit, 
I don't have any data points on this mysterious diary. So for those out there listening live, part of being that, you know, personal researcher, I mean, have you, have you seen anything on the actual diary? Well, the, the diary I thought was, was just a book published by uh, his son, wasn't it? I've seen some handwritten pages from it, and I think it has been authorized as his handwriting, but um, maybe that those were pages out of context. I couldn't be sure. Yeah, I, I, and that's the other thing. So it's like, okay, so this is so important to all of us because, again, we have an unexplored continent other than natu oil, natural resource drilling. And they're like, oh, you know, it's, it's not like this is a big surprise. I mean, for years they've been directional drilling has brought up. I don't think people really get how oil drilling really works. I have somebody who did it. Um, and just the techs that manage, we're talking, they go miles. They, they swerve and they curve and they pull up all sorts of debris. And in many cases, it's been tropical uh, plants or even we have petrified trees on the Antarctic uh, continent, as you pointed out, it's extremely ancient. And there are trees that are petrified there that existed pre-dinosaurs. So right. here, here we go. It's okay. So it's a very mysterious continent. It's deserving of more adventure and research. So before we even get into the general topic, I, I want to stop because as I got more and more frustrated, I'm already planning an expedition back to the Grand Canyon. I'm sick of people talking about it. I'm a climber. Uh, I have lots of friends, that were it, very, very advanced uh, people I trust to do the work that it's going to need to do to do two or three. Th we go to Devil's Tower, you know, that's 1,200 feet. That's, that's, it's not a big deal. But I got on this, I'm, it's a secondary issue, but you've been to Antarctica. What was it like? Not that you don't have resources on it, but. Yeah, well, yeah it's an otherworldly type of environment. You guys want me to describe it? Briefly? Please. Yeah, tell us. Yeah, about I mean, it. nobody, we've never been, I don't think most of us have ever been there. No, no, very, very few people ever have. It's something like uh, I did crunch the numbers, they Lonely Planet book. Believe it or not, there's a 256 page travel guide to Antarctica published by Lonely Planet. And someone on my uh, sailboat had a copy and I read it from cover to cover twice. It was the only really compelling book I had. So I just basically memorize all these facts and figures and, and one of them was the annual uh, tourism load is about 350,000 people and if you think about the barrier to entry to get down there that's actually a lot last year it didn't happen because of covid or very very few made it through because you just couldn't travel to argentina or chile and down there on uh, terra del fuego on the southern tip of south america called the isle of fire named for the not volcanoes, which I was expecting to see, or anything um, geo geothermal, but actually the fires that were made by the Patagonian giants that were huge, huge people next to the Europeans that lived on, with very few clothes in one of the most inhospitable places in the world. So you leave from there. And you just go south across this Drake Passage into the Southern Ocean, the fifth ocean of the world. You ever want to win a bar bet, have someone name the five oceans? I think nine out of ten will not know the Southern Ocean is the fifth. And it is notoriously the roughest seas in the world. We got terribly seasick. I lost about 25 pounds on the whole trip. Just didn't eat for about a week. And you know, uh, threw Yeah, because you did the I sailboat. Had. You did the yeah, sailboat, right? There's there's barriers to entry. Even cruise ships, 50% of passengers get seasick. And you can fly over too, but then the costs just go up extra uh, ordinarily the farther in you go. So if you want to take an expedition and check out that pyramid poking through the ice, I know where it is. And I've talked to people who have flown over it that don't think it's anything more than a nun attack, which is their word for an attractive mountain. But I asked them, do you ever stop there and maybe with a geologist or archaeologist and poke around? They said they never have. So All right. Well, let me let me just covered down there. Let me just interrupt Sorry, you for ahead. one second. I just no want to problem. interrupt you for one second. Recap Goblin puts in here that you need permission from over 180 countries to even go to Antarctica. And I, I want you to go ahead and tell him that's not true, is it? No, it's not true. Um, you don't need permission except for the country that you leave from. So we did have to go to the 
customs house in Ushuaia, Argentina, register the boat, know who the captains are. They have to be in touch because our lives are at stake. If something were to go wrong with the boat, we need to call for help. And they photocopied our passports. And I'll tell you the one unique thing about going there is we we're already stamped into Argentina and they stamped us out. And for 26 days, I was not stamped into anywhere, which is kind of weird because usually when you go international travel, you go somewhere and then you disembark and then you get stamped back in. So there's nothing like that in Antarctica. In fact, per the Antarctica Treaty ratified in 61, you don't need to get special permission from anyone. Uh, it is reserved for science and exploration. And it says specifically that trip can go where they want. Now, there are some places that are uh, off limits, such as the snowfly zone over the South Pole. So and who, who enforces others. that? So the, that is kind of like international law, because the Antarctica Treaty basically sets aside the whole continent as a biosphere, like a national park, but a world park. There are six countries that still make certain claims and there are some old legacy bases, which they allow to uh, carry on. But it's expensive and difficult to maintain a base down there. So we saw a few that were, uh, well, some old whaling stations that were in total ruins, like a ghost town. But other ones that had closed down, one became a museum at Port Lockeroy, which was the, one of the British bases that was spying on the Nazis during the whole New Schwabenland World War II. And they were largely responsible for feeding the information to the Americans and were part of that expedition to extract the remaining loyalists to uh, the Third Reich. And they presumably lost that battle. And the Fourth Reich then became what it was. That's a whole other discussion. But uh, what Antarctica is like, in just a nutshell, it's otherworldly, you guys. It's really, if you could go to another planet, like an ice planet, that'd be it. Because there's it, really nothing green or orange or red. It's just blue, black, and white are <laughs> the three colors you see everywhere. Is it sunny down there? Like, a, is, it, is it like a blue sky, or is it cloudy and kind of like snowing all the time? Oh, we got all three. One day it did snow, about a foot on, a top, on the hull of our boat that we had to help shovel off. Uh, there were mostly cloudy days. It's stormy down there. It's usually winter jacket weather, even in the height of summer, when the days are 20, 21, 22 hours long, including a couple hours of twilight. Uh, and then it only gets dark very briefly in the middle of their summer down there, which is pretty cool to experience the midnight sun. But the uh, there were a couple days where it was sunny. And we were sitting on the deck and actually getting a suntan in our bathing suits. And I did the uh, polar plunge three times, which is jumping into the water amid the icebergs. Two times we're at the Vernansky uh, Research Station run by the Ukrainians, which happened to be another British base that was spying on the uh, Nazis during World War II. And down there at the Vernansky base, now run by the Ukrainians, then they have a sauna they let us use to run in and out of the water. There is the southernmost bar in the world. It's called the Faraday Bar, named after the uh, British inventor Faraday. Came up with the Faraday cage and things others in his name. So that was kind of cool. They threw out the red carpet and they brew their own vodka down there. So we were hooting it up uh, till the wee hours with the Ukrainians one night. <laughs> so was there a glare? Was there was there was it like a the sun beaming off the snow like in your face the whole time? Was it? Was it nah. like deep snow or, yeah. or was it? No, it's just like Jared out in the snow in Minnesota. It's it's pretty much the same. It's nothing uh, brighter or different from the way you see the uh, snow in the mountains and the ocean. All right. Just want to no. give a shout out to Hot Sauce here. He just gave us a super chat, though. Uh, thanks a lot, Hot Sauce. Uh, distorted. <laughs> this, I think it was. Uh, let me see here. Uh, Red Cap Goblin wants to know, would it be possible to get declassified maps of Bird's Route and recreate it? And then Distorted Reality said, I just got a hardback book of the of Bird that is signed, and his second book has all kinds of maps inside. Now I'm assuming he's talking about his son that, that published the book with the diary in it. I mean, I'm sure that's where it all came out. You know, that's where it all came from. 
you know, and then he, he might have released some pages of the diary here and there, but but it's all coming from his kid. You, I mean, what do you think, Brad? Can can this can the route be recreated? Is is there any way to know which route he actually took for high jump? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. They came from two directions. That much is on Wikipedia. It's well known. Uh, what happened, the circumstances of the Battle of High Jump, that's actually still classified. Boy, would that be great to, to take a look at that, be among the first researchers to have a look at the declassified documents about what really happened during Operation High Jump. But um, just just to uh, consider the, uh, the maps, yeah, it's pretty well known. They came from the East Coast of the U.S., and they also came from the, the Pacific Fleet. And then they, um, I don't know the exact details. Some of them went to Little America that uh, Admiral Byrd founded, which isn't too far away from McMurdo Station, which is run by the Americans, and it's the largest base in Antarctica. And to get for, to it, you fly in and out of New Zealand. To get to the New Schwabenland area claimed by the Nazis, the closest continent is South Africa. And then all the Palmer Peninsula is accessed via South America. All right. So they didn't come down that way. And then one group went towards New Schwabenland or they rendezvoused in Terra del Fuego and then went over there. And that's where the Battle of High Jump occurred. All right. Barry wants to know what kind of wind did you guys have when you were there in your sailboat? And does uh, the Navionics work there? Not sure what Navionics means. If that's some sort of uh, communication device, we did have several different uh radios of course it's it's hairy man so we are kind of late getting out of ushuaia on the first day and they're running this like a charter boat so everybody wants to be on time and they have a schedule they want to keep but uh it was 11 poles and three americans and it was kind of a polish joke that they didn't figure out that the rudder was stuck in the mud for the first day so we actually could not leave ushuaia until it was getting close to night. And then the next day we woke up and we we're still on the Beagle Channel. And they said there was a little bit of a, not a little bit, it was a big weather disturbance that had just passed by Terra del Fuego. And so the captain, we were all together and he was saying that um, what we want to do is catch the end of that storm and it'll just fling us down there real quick. And that part was right. We made it in uh, 92 hours, just under four days, to get down to the first island, which is St. George Island. And there was a Polish base there called Arktowski, and that was our first landfall. And boy, were we glad to go ashore and hang out with them. And we partied one night with them. It was really fun. Uh, they let us take showers. One and only time I used Wi-Fi on the trip. Um, but it was, there were fierce winds, to answer your caller's question. Um, I just remember the waves being ginormous. And when we weren't seasick, we'd have to help out with watch. And once we start getting down towards the South Shetland Islands, where King George Island's the largest of, um, there were the big icebergs. That was the first thing I saw, is just icebergs as big as a 30-story a flat-top building. And they were just like, out know, there, scattered all around? Well, no. At first, it was just the giant ones, uh, way off in the distance. If you know the Mercantile Mart in Chicago, it's like a big 30-story monolithic building right along the Chicago River there. It kind of reminded me of that, just yeah. massive thing. And then once we got in, yeah, there were some channels that were really chock full of ice. One we couldn't pass on the attempt to go through. It's called the Lemire Channel. But then after Vernansky Base, we did make it through. And it was just, oh, utterly spectacular. Uh, oh, oh. And only first sailed by a French admiral a little over 100 years ago. So a lot of these places were are still being discovered and mountains being climbed. So, for example, there's a couple giant granite soaring rocks right out of the ocean uh, at the entrance to the Lemire Channel. The Lonely Planet book said they had only just been climbed in the late 1990s. So, so people are still 
making first descents and still naming mountains and finding stuff down there. And it's, it's, it's that kind of place. It's very dangerous. Uh, the level of entry is high because you got to get across these stormy seas. And then it's just most of the time it's really cold as hell. And the wind gets going. It could be life endangering. You have to seek shelter. Or yeah. You could easily die of exposure. Does it seem like the weather is is like um, like paranormal in some way? Like like the weather is is kind of like it's not normal. Like it, you know what I'm saying? Like it's like maybe some kind of defense mechanism for the for the pole. No, nah, I didn't really pick that up when I was down there. To be honest with you, yeah. I mean I don't think it'd be much different if you went to the North Pole. You get warm days, you get cold days, and you get very long days because you're way up at that, those latitudes. Uh, we made it to within one degree of the Antarctic Circle. And everything below the Antarctic Circle, all the way to South Pole, that's where you have the 24 hours of daylight uh, leading up to and during the solstice. Conversely, you have uh, the darkness during the winter solstice at both poles. And that's what the Arctic Circle means in our northern latitudes. All so right. uh, it's a different world down there, but it's still, you can still tell it's Earth. Um, great to see all the penguins live. You know, we always saw them in the zoo and it was funny to watch them. But down there, just, man, the penguin colonies, thousands of them up on hillsides. You're like, wow, how the heck did they get way up there and stuff? And, and uh, they're very, uh, very animated. And they have no fear of humans with, with the animals. We had a whale swim right under our boat. Uh, him looking at us as much as we were looking at him and going right up to elephant seals or uh, leopard seals laying on the rock or some of them are waiting for the penguins to just walk by at night and snatch them. All right. So let me, blood let, stains. let me, let me ask you, I mean, I mean, obviously you're at the, you're at this point, you're sailing around Antarctica. Is there yeah. anyone stopping you from just getting out of the boat and, and taking a walk wherever you no. wanted to on the island? So you could literally, you know, Un- unload a whole boat full of supplies and hike to inner earth if you wanted, right? Yes, you can. Uh, if you knew where it was, because you got to understand Antarctica is the fifth largest continent in the world. So the distances are vast. If you wanted to find a location, say what I would love to do is go with a film crew to uh, base 211, the new Berlin base, try to locate it. I think I know where it's at and just go snoop around there for a week or two. It'll cost you. That's the thing. You better come with a budget. And if you're bringing a film crew uh, and it's any period more than a a few days or a week, you're talking million dollar budget. Easy. And it only goes up from there. But if you wanted to do something independent like I did, I I went down there about the least expensive way you could possibly go for the amount of time that we went. Yeah. And you can do it. Nobody's trying to stop you. Yeah. No, not at all. All right. Jared, let me ask you, you you are you're looking at maybe putting together a team to go to Antarctica, right? Yeah. Um, you know, obviously not already, right now, but one far, day. Yeah, well, we're pretty far along with planning to go back to the Grand Canyon. Um uh the issue isn't equipment because we we have double what we would need to uh set proper routes to secure equipment or you know that, but the Antarctica is an entirely different trip. And I've looked at the French shipping vessels and the assorted independent uh, methods. Like Brad saying, it's exactly right. Uh, on the cheap side, if you were doing it without a completely pro film crew, you could probably do this for maybe a half a million. But again, by the time, depending on the length of time you're going and to pay everybody and to get everything dumped in there and back, um, it's. I, I kind of figured it was going to end up being around a million. But the other thing is no one goes to, like he's saying, it's it basically Antarctica, if you just take the map of America and throw it down, it's slightly bigger than that. All right. I mean, so uh, if anybody is listening and, and they want us to uh, do a special and document a trip to Antarctica, just PayPal me a million dollars and we yeah. will get a trip together and go. That's not a problem. But you might, I think it's more like a million point two because it's not just the money it takes to get there. You know, you have to pay for your bills and everything, you know, for for your place while you're gone as well. It's not just a vacation. 
that you're paying for. It's it's uh it's all the missed work, and you have to still pay the bills at home when you go. So one point two million dollars, and we will set that up. Just send me a PayPal. <laughs> you can send me an email, and uh, and uh, I will let you know what my PayPal address is. No problem. So, Jared, <laughs> what is it that you want to go there for? Why do you want to go uh, there? Is it because I, of is is it because of of what we're hearing about inner Earth? Because of what we're hearing in Admiral Byrd's diary, which is which is most likely a fake. Um, so, well, it's two things. One, it's there are certain things that in the circle, like contact in the desert, there are certain things that continuously keep coming up. And for people who are new to the subjects, it's very exciting to get into it and learn about, oh, oh, everyone, that's the train no one's heard for a while because I'm sitting on the train tracks, literally. Um, but I'm, I am a very inquisitive person and I like to do the research and I'm, I don't want to just chat about this story about Admiral Byrd going somewhere and doing something one day when the questions we want to answer, there's a number one, there's post diluvian post post younger drives uh, cultures that have gone there, like the Vikings or uh, other societies. Why do we have the P Reese Reese map? Why are the maps of the sea Kings, including Antarctica? Why um, those are just contemporary maps that clearly indicate a much more extensive traveling people. Could it be the Phoenicians? Sure. But, what about much, much earlier? What about that city off of Cuba? What about the worldwide polygonal cymatic blocks? So it, 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 it shows that there's at least one ancient advanced human society that was here. And Antarctica is one of those places where we can't not uh, fall into something. And so right now we have this big fat story about there's a, yeah, okay. If we could get to inner earth and Jules Verne, this stuff, super duper, but I don't, want us to continue to chat about it without with the incredible amount of money out there and for all those out there that are collecting the oddest things the age of people like arthur or arturo pazansky uh true exp you know true explorers it's time to get back to it it's time to go it's time to uh continue to inform people but it's also time to do the work so to go isn't for me it's not about yeah, it's like, oh, like what Brad said, not everybody goes. Well, okay, that no, that part's true. It's But for us and for people interested like Brad, myself, you, others out there listening, there is zero reason not to make an expedition into planet and go back and make a serious attempt at looking at the layers of information, finding what we can find on an extended trip. Uh, there was a point where explorers were just happy to find and put a flag in the ground and go, well, we didn't die and we made it to, you know, the center of this or the center of that. So this case, if we can locate an entrance to inner earth, okay, great. But do I think that there is legitimate um, archaeological work to be done there? Absolutely. So taking a solid guess with two kilometers or two miles of ice or a mile, uh, that's going to make it really hard to do any per se digging. But we have those mountainsides and those other areas. Like Brad said, what, where's the geologist? You know, we're going to go with interdisciplinary skills. It's not just that you have the balls yeah. or can withstand the cold. The, the idea is to go with an interdisciplinary group that can recognize, are you looking at a natural pyramid? Or are you looking at something that was built? Has it been weathered and destroyed or is it uh, functioning? So there's a couple out there things that people keep saying about Antarctica and it's not impossible to go. Um, uh, I've, I've, in business, I've shipped things from China, for instance. I know how shipping containers work. I know how mass. I, I know what it costs to work from a factory to get things shipped and moved, and then across country. There is a lot of layers of logistics in order to uh, lease a ship, in order to have it uh, captained to a port, and uh, exactly somebody like Brad who's also interested, done the work, been there. And for everyone out there listening, I mean, look at just, this is good that everyone's participating in the chat, but I want to bring attention to everyone in the chat that exactly those kind of comments. Well, you need to get a, a parchment signature from 160 countries. That's not what was said, but there's so much misinformation about going to Antarctica alone. I think it's super important that just the topic of Brad bringing up that you can go there are sailboats, there are cruise ships, there are French resupply ships. There's a lot of different things you can hop 
to get to a lot of different places, including Brad already, I was going to ask yeah. him what, like what the bars were like and Brad, were there any other, like what's a bar or a restaurant look like in Antarctica? What does eating <laughs> in Antarctica look like? Oh, good. Right. Guys got to understand nobody's down there. They're all leaving right now to the point where it's an abandoned continent over the cold months coming up, uh, including winter solstice down there, which is our June 21st up here. There's only a thousand people on the entire continent and they're all working in bases. You have to have some kind of shelter. There's no such thing as camping or backpacking. Maybe in the summer months, you could do an expedition for a couple days. Prince Harry went cross-country skiing. Remember when all the elite were going down there in 2015, 2016? He went down there and he did his cross-country trip from 89 parallel south to 90 degrees, which is Pone. And they were gone for about a week and they outfitted the whole thing. What's interesting, they went right over that no-fly zone area. And they presumably had a look at uh, that gaping hole. Now, you got to understand where that hole is reported to be. And Linda Moulton Howe's whistleblowers talk about it. And uh, uh, other researchers, including what's mentioned in Bird's diary. Let's just collect all these and say that's a data point. So we're looking at what could be located down there. And you look at Google Earth, they have a big white screen in a circle even. Uh, which could give you the indication of where it's located. Yeah. But it is, it is up on the uh, polar plateau, which is over two miles of ice. So even if it's just a hole in the ice, okay, which is perfectly plausible because Antarctica is the most volcanic continent in the world. There's 91 known volcanoes. What if there's a great big molten pool down there that has just popped open the top ice dome? Safe enough, big enough, reportedly like 35 or 50 miles across big enough that bird and others would feel safe dropping their plane into it flying into it getting to the bottom and circling back around and having enough room to maneuver a plane like that yeah that'd be fascinating wouldn't it would be fascinating but you know who is uh working at south pole which is another american base it's called the amundsen scott South Pole Station, named after the first two explorers that got there within 35 days of each other, except the British Scott Party, all five of them perished on the ice, where the Norwegian Amundsen, the first to pole, he got back safely with his team. But at that station, which you can visit, you usually have to call ahead of time, as we did when we anchored and went ashore at the stations we went to, including the U.S. base called Palmer, the other third major American base down there, uh, they have to say, okay, you're clear to come in. And you can. And I know people who have flown to Pole, and I know people who have worked at Pole and, and done uh, supply runs. And that's what Brian S., uh, Linda Moulton Howe's whistleblower, said he was doing. But they got an emergency call at another base, and the direct route was through the no-fly zone. And that's when he saw the big gaping hole in the ice. Now, what may be down there, if it's mega flora and mega fauna, as some uh, of the more outlandish stories suggest, another world down there, an inner earth, I don't know. Now, when you, uh, when you say down it's there, it's the center of the earth. Yeah, when, sorry. When you, that's all right. When you say down there, you're basically talking about, like, if there was a big hole in the ice. Well, that's a right. weird sound that's coming in there. There, it's it's gone now. So it's basically a like a, a two mile deep hole in the ice that goes down to the ground. Uh, Hot Sauce wants to know. Uh, he sent another super chat. Thanks a lot, Hot Sauce. He she. Uh, what about the rumor that Antarctica is Atlantis covered in ice? So it could basically be like a, a two mile deep hole in the ice. Maybe what like two three miles wide, four miles wide. How how wide would the hole be? Oh, uh, uh, I said earlier thirty five to fifty. 50 miles miles it's massive so yeah. it so it could easily be atlantis there something could be down there uh if there's even large so mega fauna and mega flora means giant so there's there's supposedly mastodons and giant sloths that are 15 feet tall and all kinds of really 
it, to, to the logical mind seems outrageous. And this that all it could even be living in Antarctica, too. And this but all came from that, Bird's Diary? Uh, portions of it have, and there have been a couple other data points that have said there's something like that down there. Can you, what, what other data points can you refer us to? Uh, well, nothing came out of Prince Harry. They didn't even admit they went to it. But I have heard just, uh, of people, other explorers from the 19th century uh, is one. And I think there's a modern person, too. Also, there was there were two women who were going to uh, cross-country ski across the whole of the Polar Plateau one year. And this was in Nexus magazine. And it was picked up by uh, some New Zealand papers because the girls, before they set out, they said what they were going to do. And they came up upon that no-fly, no-go zone. And out of nowhere, they had not seen the hole. They didn't even know it was there. But they had just rooted it in a way that they were going to cross by it. And so before they got there, um, all these... Uh, Helicopters came out and intercepted them and said, uh, you're not actually going any further, ladies. Get in the helicopter. We're taking you back the way you came. And they did. I mean, the women protested and, and uh, stomped and screamed and said, you're destroying our tr your lifetime dream. They said, well, you can't go there. It's a no-go zone. So there are places like that. And they will come out and intercept you. So just to say, oh, well, we're going to go down even to the the old German base, 211, it could still be occupied. It could still be used. In my talk, The Hidden Anomalies of Antarctica, I show one of the three, which I believe is the most verifiable of the three reported motherships that are defunct and under the ice and partly protruding. Another one, I reproduce a photo in Beyond Esoteric, which most of my Antarctica information is in this latest book. And the one I show in the New Schwabenland area, just about 100 miles inland from the mountains, up on the polar plateau is this giant craft. And if you go back in the Wayback Machine of Google to the year 2013 and do the coordinates, the GPS coordinates for the Conan base, you'll come to it. It's a seasonal base. It's on maps. In fact, I saw this this on a map from the pre end of the cold war. So they were cold war era maps, one produced by Nat Geo in, I think it was 1986. So the cold war was still going on and the flags in New Schwabenland were for West Germany. The West German government existed during the cold war. So this is the point. The Germans have never left and they knew about this craft under the ice. And it's, I believe, one of the three called Nina Pinta and Santa Maria, named after Columbus's three ships, the nicknames for them. And this has got to be one of them. And an additional data point on that is the uh, remote viewers over at the Firesight Institute remote viewed this location and said it was some kind of massive machine under the ice. So in the 2013 shot that I have in my presentation, you can actually see a forward base above the ice. So there's a landing strip for planes. There's a snowmobile loop uh, and, and other snowmobile tracks around it. And they, they appear to have been digging it out in 2013. You can see a lot of uh, dig and uh, coloration on the snow that there's big excavation going on. Subsequent years after that, including today, if you were to go there, it's like they put um, a circus tent or something up. You just see these poles that are collecting the snow and it's all covered up again. But quite telling when it was uh, exposed and could be seen. And I think that's the best evidence we have for one of these ships. Hey, uh, I, got a, I got a question before you, before we get too far. Do you, yeah. in your opinion, I've not seen any good information. Of course, it's online, right? Ha, to your knowledge, is there a place everybody can look and actually say, okay, here is the grayed out area of where the alleged hole is, or is it just a, again, since the whole continent's the size of America, is it in Texas, Minnesota, or Rhode Island? <laughs> I mean, well, it's, it's not too far from the South Pole. Let's so it is way. it like, so if we're looking at the map, cause everybody gets dropped on, like if you get dropped somewhere in Antarctica, it's, well, you're clearly stopping, like you said, when you called ahead. So you took the sailboat. 
I want to back it up so for people to get that they can hop because I know the sailboats, the quotes I saw were eight to twelve thousand for a sailboat. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got a good deal and paid uh, six thousand per person, about as low as you could go. We had to pay cash for it, and that was an ordeal in and of itself, trying to round up that much yeah, it is. hard cash, even though we had it, but getting it through uh, to Argentina was difficult. But we made it work. The, yeah, and then so when you get so when you get the boat set up, then what what happens with where's your first stop when you get to Antarctica, and where do you stay? Well, that was on uh, King George Island at the Polish Arktowski base. But the entire time we slept in our bunks in the boat. So we were assigned bunks and that's where you had your personal belongings. And uh, Emily, a girlfriend at the time, she was the bunk above me and I had the, the wider one down below. And we could occasionally lay together and listen to coast to coast or something on the headphones to entertain ourselves because yeah. there were yeah. hours, or, hours or conflict too. radio <laughs> yeah, there we go <laughs> hey, uh, Bre- um barry wanted to ask you a question brad uh, uh jared is that a train uh yeah i'm gonna mute myself out that's, Man, that's so a new loud. train. uh barry wants to know how big your boat was and before you answer that, a red cap goblin wants to know if you were also able to see the moon there. See the moon. It did poke out once in a while. Uh, I'm sure we did see it. It is down there as well as uh, those very, very long days because I was down there um, from mid-January till mid-February in 2019. So... Uh, the days were very long. It was only a month past the solstice by the time we got there. So the days were still quite long. And uh, the boat was 72 feet. And it had a forward galley that was waterproof that had a like a submarine round handle you had to spin around to open. And that was good because that was an air compartment in case we impacted a iceberg, which could be deadly for everyone aboard if we were to take on water so that's so that's we're a, going say again i'm sorry i was going to say that that's a pretty big sailboat that's not uh your little 40 foot you know no 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 it was it was a former racing boat it was built as a new zealand racing boat um so it was very well constructed very solid boat but this was her maiden voyage it's called the chief one and it was uh, anchored out of gdansk poland and I think it's still down there. They, they did keep it there uh, last season, and they, they did a couple charters to Antarctica. But I think this year they weren't able to uh, run any trips. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So next, that, my next question is, as you're sleeping in your bunks, you said you guys had to call ahead to different bases. So how do you get off the boat? Literally, for people to understand this, I know what a normal sure. dock and slip looks like, but you get off of what is really more galleon-style uh, you know, large sailing craft, but you get off of it and you're picked up by giant snowmobile tracked vehicle. What? <laughs> uh, no, no. Here's what hap- What happens every time. Uh, very rare. No, there was not a single time we came to an actual dock with the sailboat. It was always dropping an anchor, getting a secure, uh, firm foothold. And then there was a winch on the front, which could lift up and we'd help do this with our crew because we weren't really there as guests we're more part of the crew we had duties and chores included with the cost of the trip and so one of them was getting the dinghy in the water and it's a big uh, zodiac about a 12 foot long zodiac with a upward motor and one of the guys would jump down there and then come around alongside the chief one and then they had a rope ladder we dropped down and then one by one we'd uh, board the zodiac and then the zodiac would take us ashore but there were days where we could go off and do adventures and we did including some really funny ones which i did shoot a lot of video down there and we put it together on sci spy tv and it's a 16 part episode series that i narrate called uh, antarctica by sail and one of the funnier times we got in the zodiac and this, the, co- the co-captain, his name was Vortek, and he was a risk taker. He's, he was just in his uh, mid-30s, but a real 
badass sailor. Like he would go for it. And I'm so glad we got him on our trip. So he liked us three Americans. And so one day he says, uh, Oh, we got the Zodiac and we're going to go collect some ice for drinks. And what did we do? We went to a massive glacier where the ice is blue. And that means it's really, really old. And so the guys like to drink this glacier ice because once you put it in your uh, mixed drink, I only learned this when I got down there, it pops like popcorn in your glass. And every, they think it's so funny for the first timers to see this. When we went to Arktowski base, they had drinks for us with glacier ice that popped in your glass. So, so it's little things like that that are funny. So we'd go there with an ice pick and collect our own glacier ice for drinks that night. So uh, when you say it pops, uh, what does it keep? Does it constantly pop or does it stop after a while? And what would it cause that? It stops as it melts. Yeah, there's like little air bubbles in it, I think, oh, is okay. what the explanation is. And it might be part of the reason why the ice turns blue. Is okay, who wants, who wants ice and... Uh, Two thousand year old bubonic plague or two million year old bubonic plague? <laughs> yeah, well, possibly, Jared. Who knows? But it, uh, it was quite a it phenomenon. It could be. It could be the healthiest thing there. you could drink, probably. I, yeah, it could be. So I'm not Mr. Negative Nancy. My last name's Murphy. I have to err on the side of Murphy's law. There you go. It's it's like why is Brad twitching at well, this if point? If you're if you're planning on going to Antarctica, Jared, you better pack a lot of water if you're not going to drink. You know, melted yeah. ice. I'll I'll take Mastin. On pee, I'm good. I'm fine. I'll do it. Yeah, I'll give it a it's, shot. It's pretty pure down there, Jared. I think you, when you see how big these icebergs are, it's this a lot of volume of water. So that same day, the uh, vortex. We were in the Zodiac, the four of us, Emily and uh, Luke Dog. He lives up in Seattle, and we're still bros and hang out every time he comes through. Um, the four of us we got our turn basically because the other guys would get turns as well. And what did we want to do? Well, Emily wanted to walk on a glacier and this can be kind of dangerous. We've come across videos of guys that are up there with ice picks climbing and the thing turns and throws them off and could crush you if you land the wrong way. But at the very least you're going to be cold as fuck and struggling in the big suits to try to swim and tread water before your Zodiac can get you because you will die of hypothermia within minutes. So there's, it's wrought with danger down there, but we walked down a glacier and uh, didn't flip on us. And that was pretty cool. And then after that, we saw a pod of uh, whales and they were putting their fins up and kind of doing their thing. You, you see the spout holes. So we said, yeah, let's go up closer. And we got within uh, probably 50 yards and there they were. And I'm just thinking, man, if one of them uh, didn't like us around and wanted to tip our boat over, we'd be so screwed. But they're very docile animals. It, it hurts them to touch anything. It, sound, it sounds solid. like you had a. It sounds like you had an awesome time. Uh, I I wanted to uh, just give a shout out to everybody here in the chat. We've got quite the crowd in here today. Uh, if you could do us a favor and hit that like button, it really helps the algorithm with the video so that more people can come in and, and check it out. So just hit that like button, make sure you're subscribed. I want to talk to you, Brad, and I guess this, this might just be a stupid question, but along the edges of Antarctica, is there anywhere where, where there's like grass growing or, or, or like where you can see the ground at all, or is it all just completely covered with ice? So we traveled for over 15 days. It was a new location every day. We went inside Deception Island Crater, which is still an active volcano, just last erupted uh, 69 and wiped out two modern research stations. But they're still there. They've reformed uh, because it, and it's also a UFO hotspot coming in and out of that volcanic uh, neck. Did you see where any? The harbor is. We did not. But there were reported sightings at another one of the Argentinian bases that uh, we were told about at the Brown Argentinian base. Did you happen to have any uh, night vision goggles at all or anything? We didn't. And it really wasn't a dark, dark night out for only a couple hours. So it was mostly just daylight and you could see. Yeah. Um, the thing is, uh, unless we're going through some channels... And the, the scenery is nice. Sometimes you just prefer to be below deck because the weather is pretty extreme. 
we'd all have to take turns and go up on deck for watch, even when the weather wasn't so nice. But there were days where we'd be cruising along and everybody would be up on deck for hours on end, just marveling at the scenery. It's just so beautiful. So the question was about color, and that's a great question. When we got to Arktowski Base, which is one of the Pan-Antarctic Island, one of the outer islands, um, but not too far, only 100 miles from the mainland peninsula, there was an exhibit of all the mosses and lichens that exist down there. They had a pretty much a scientific collection of things that grow. So there were patches in the northernmost part, which there is the warmer part, of, of uh, patches of lichen and, and sometimes orin uh, growing on the rocks. But you get like peat moss type, uh, not really meadows, but little certain areas. And that was about the only green we saw. And then after we left there and went towards the mainland of Palmer, there wasn't anything growing. There's no trees, there's no grass, there's nothing green, there's no algae. It's just black rock and white from the snow and the glaciers and the white clouds and the blue of the sky and the blue of the ocean. And it struck me one day when we were sitting on deck looking at these colors and just being in this otherworldly environment that that's the same thing that happens when you scuba dive. You start to lose all of the primary colors except for blue. And then the deeper you go, you start to lose blue and white and it just becomes pitch black. But in Antarctica, it's the same thing. It's blue, black, and white. And the Black Mountains, uh, so e Eastern Antarctica is a very, very old continent. That was the one that was once connected to Pangaea. West Antarctica is the new one. And I say 700 million years old in geologic terms it is. And it's like the Rocky Mountains, uh, spectacular mountain scenery there. But in this case, you have glaciers between the mountains that flow right down into the ocean. And I remember one day me and Luke Dog were up on deck and we're looking at this mountain and we knew that a lot of them had never been climbed and maybe not even named. And there was this really cool ice field way, way up on one. And I go to Luke, you think anybody's ever stepped foot on it? He goes, how could you? You couldn't come in a helicopter. You couldn't uh, climb to it because it's sheer cliff. So you can see places where no human has conceivably ever walked in, in spots. It's, so that's kind of the, the feeling you get down there. You're just in this forbidden land, this no man's land that seems as far away from Earth as you can get. In fact, the last unexplored places in the world are what's under the ice in Antarctica and the deepest depths of the ocean. And that's why Antarctica is so cool. It's just there's so much mystery down there. But uh to try to get to the bottom of some of these things. And as far as I know, I'm the only uh, researcher in this field that's actually been down there looking for this particular kind of stuff and asking everybody at the bases to other captains, to other people who are traveling down there, if they've heard anything about craft under the ice or antediluvian civilizations or any kind of excavations going on and weird stuff found. And, it's just little anecdotes here and there, but nothing concrete. And mostly people said, no, I had not heard of that. So you just got to deal with that, but pick up the other uh, kernels where you can find them and piece together this mosaic of what the hidden anomalies of Antarctica are really all about. All right. Jared, are you still there? Yeah, of course. I'm <laughs> you, just, uh... You've been pretty quiet. Oh, yeah, you got the... The train. Yeah, I got by. that. Yeah, another one. But uh, yeah, go ahead. I wanted to ask you, have you read this? Di I, I, I don't mean to. I guess we got to get back on the diary here for a second. Hugh Gadorn's asking some questions. And and uh, so let's let's get on this diary for a second. I wanted to talk about an incident that apparently is is written about in this diary. Have you read it? The The actual diary? No, I've just read the excerpts. And then uh, there's no... Uh, the problem with once I realized that I was, I thought based on online research and based on what I was reading, that I was reading actual excerpts, not that it was hand me down data, that it wasn't, there's no uh, uh, providence for this diary other than hearsay. And 
I have a problem with that. So all I want is someone to mark on a map. Okay, where's the entrance? You know, mark it down. I get that we can't look at it from Google Earth. Where's the entrance? What's the closest we can get based on the girls that were, you know, turned around? And even if we can't go to the entrance, then uh, what is the closest, uh, you know, I've been going over what is available for Antarctica for mapping on Google Earth. I have been looking closely at terrains, topographies of uh, exposed rock and looking at, okay, well, what are the likely locations of an ancient or prior existing societies? And can we find polygonal masonry? Can we find rock art? Can we find statues? Can we find anything above ground that we can point to that isn't already being uh, tented, covered, hidden, or a no-go zone. And that was honestly, so not that I want to answer or ask a question on, on a question that's semi-unanswered, but Brad, that no-go zone for the no-fly zone, are there no-fly zones, but you can still get there on ground or is it no-go no matter what? So it's near the South Pole, approximately one degree in the direction of the Davis base. And this is based on Brian S., who was a whistleblower for Linda Moulton Howe, who had been flying uh, cargo planes. And his story is very verifiable. And you see him in a number of pictures down there. Would have been very, very difficult to fake. Plus, he shows his badges. And nobody's ever questioned his validity. So I would go off of Brian S. before I'd go off of these uh, diaries. And I can tell you that it's approximately where Prince Harry went, and uh, it's directly. So since there is no north, south, east, and west uh, at pole, you're at all 24 time zones at once. Um, once you start heading towards, let's see, it would be between South Africa and Australia. You can just picture going from South Pole up towards that gap so the coastline there is where the uh, davis base is so it would be if you were to look i would start at south pole and then go around the one degree marks so that's 89 degrees latitude south towards the davis base and i'd be interested to see what you find uh jared if you want to scour google earth well i i've found uh just white out even real sloppily done the layering they'll just put a white a block over and you'll see some ripples in the snow or something and then just a very straight line and boxed off so you're like wow that, they didn't even attempt to even try to hide that one so some of that happens but then you can find really wild anomalous cool stuff so it's hard to say are they throwing red herrings at us or they're certainly hiding stuff from us to put a mask over certain areas. You know, isn't there a part in this diary that says like a, a UFO came out and used a laser and cut one of these warships right in half? Well, so that that's more of the narrative of Operation High Jump. That is what happened in the Battle of High Jump. And according to the diary, certain, right? Not always according to the diary. That was more Admiral Byrd's trips before high jump. And then when he came back, see, he quipped. He had a bit of a big mouth, or maybe he was boasting or just wanted to get the word out. But he told a Chilean journalist on the way back, two months into the six month expedition, that he didn't want to be alarming, but we have to confront the idea that we're facing an enemy that has the ability to fly pole to pole at incredible speeds. And so I don't know to this day if we have such a flight that can go pole to pole in one day at incredible speeds. So they must have been confronting some kind of major ET or backward engineered technology. And so the reported story was that High Jump had gotten their armada of ships and were then based uh, offshore almost like an invasion fleet and high jump was actually geared that way. There were uh, going ashore crews, kind of like a D day type of landing, but first they were going to fly over. And one day they did uh, no attack came whatsoever, but they did drop a bomb or two. The planes came back to the carrier. Then they went back the next day on a larger bombing campaign 
in which they started to bomb and then blip off the screen goes every plane and every pilot and everybody aboard never to be seen or heard from again. That same day when they're trying to figure out what happened to that fleet of planes up out of the water comes this craft and it was not able to be shot down and it made an example of one ship and sliced it in half called the USS Murdoch. And that's a weird story behind that boat that could probably take another show. Well, I would too. imagine that the boat sank, right? Oh, it did with a very high loss of life, probably lost everybody on board. So is it, is it still there? It would still be there. And I, I mean, actually talked can... to a salvage crew about possibly going. And again, the costs are extraordinarily high, especially in the Southern ocean to try to find a wreck like that. But yeah. there's an approximation of where it's at. Yeah, well, I mean that would be that would be interesting to get one of those submarines with all the cameras on it and stuff and get it down there. Jared has be, unmuted uh, himself. Yeah, because <laughs> I got questions. Not questions, but to Brad's to reaffirm, I'm not I'm not messing around here as far as wanting to go and take the time to uh, go inland to as far as we can. I know I know Brad may not love the idea of being also a Wim Hof practitioner, but I mean, what is it, 40 to 50 below zero? It's as cold. You know, it's not ideal is all the time down cold? there, correct? Uh, it can be. It will be getting that cold in the winter. If What's you look like at in- those uh, earth charts of the hottest and warmest, and they'll tell you what's going on in the world. You know that map? It's a syndicated column. Uh, quite regularly, the coldest place on the planet is the Vostok Station in East Antarctica. Just like the hottest is typically uh, Death Valley during the summer. Wow, so I'm, I have a question. I'm just going to throw out there: is is it is there any seawater that's frozen, or is it all like uh, is it all freshwater frozen? Well, seawater uh, does freeze, but when it freezes, it's mostly the freshwater component. So the water is actually. Uh, it has more salty, but then as the ice melts, as the icebergs flow out, it's, uh, it's, it's more fresh water. So where the convergence is between the Atlantic, the Indian, and the Pacific Oceans, there's this big upwelling, and that, that's the general boundary of where the Southern Ocean is. But yeah, it freezes for sure. Any water will freeze if it's cold enough, and it gets cold down there. So those shelves they expand pretty much out to this conversion point in the middle of winter just after winter solstice and then they will uh break apart and float away and as they float northern more north they just start melting away and eventually they just completely melt Mm -hmm. um but it is fresh water that locks up in the glaciers and the ice shelves so I mean, is it con- is it is it snowing or does it rain there? I, like, um, I guess it what snowed I'm, one day. What I'm asking is, is if there's two miles of ice that's built up on top of this continent, how the heck does do you get it? I mean, how do you how do you get it that high? I mean, I mean, it's fascinating. It's been collecting and accumulating for a long, long time. It's fascinating. Actually, I mean, considering- Antarctica is more of a desert continent. It doesn't rain and it only snows a little bit. It was just one day it snowed on us. We got about a half a foot on our boat. Um, and, it, and I love snow. I'm a skier. So I went and felt it. And it was this light, what we call wild snow in skiing, where you can take a scoop up and hold it in your glove and then go and blow it. And just poof, flies away. So as a powder skier, we love the wild snow. And, and that was, as I recall, the uh, composition of the snow. You know, the Eskimos used to have, what, 22 words for ice and snow? Yeah. And we just have those two. So if you live in it, you certainly describe it in its different forms of uh, states of melting. But the two miles, that's just, is it solid ice, or is it like a mix of ice and snow, or or is it just like a giant ice cube? Just a big, solid wall of ice but wherever there's volcanic activity there could be these domes under the ice and that's what's really interesting so the uh the russians at the vostok station 
which is way out in the middle of nowhere in East Antarctica, probably three or four degrees from Pole, one of the coldest places on Earth, they were able to drill through the polar plateau to get down to Lake Vostok. And Lake Vostok is one of the top 10 largest lakes in the world that probably no one's ever even heard of because it's only been fairly recently discovered. Well, they got a drill down there in 2012, but it was contaminated with the kerosene so the drill doesn't break. And they had to keep trying. And again, in 2016, just a few years ago, they finally got through to the dome over the lake and they got a sample of the water and they tested it and found some bacteria that has never been discovered before. And they think it came off of a fish that has never been discovered before. So there could be life in Lake Vostok that is completely different than anything we can imagine on the surface. I would bet that there is, yeah. Geothermically warmed lake under the dome of ice. Can you imagine how cool that would be to see just the blue of light from the 24 hours of sunlight they get in the summer solstice down there? What an otherworldly environment exists right here on our planet. And no eyes, no man has ever been in there before. Uh, Okay, so while you guys have been talking, I wanted to look something up, and I thought this would be great for everyone listening. So follow this. Uh, The expeditions to Antarctica Peninsula and South Georgia, the African and Oriental Travel Company, which none of us are endorsing, by the way, uh, is going back for favorite ice formations again. And you can choose and join our Antarctica scuba diving expedition, which we do, uh, the Antarctic cruise that has scuba diving as an activity. So you can, the next one was scheduled for December 21, 2021, who knows if that happened, but Participating, uh, you get to do an Antarctica scuba diving expedition. Allows you to dive with ice formations, catch sight of penguins and seals, and mix your diving trips while watching whales and shore visits. While not getting and getting into your dry suits for a cold water dive. So, not only can you go to Antarctica, folks, and you don't need anyone else's permission. If you're not cold enough on the surface, it's probably warmer underwater, actually. So. You can dive. That's you can go crazy. on a diving expedition to Antarctica, Justin, and and, d- and dive water areas. Yeah, Justin Case just said the lowest temperature measured at Vostok Station, Antarctica, was minus one hundred twenty-eight degrees. Could you imagine? There you go. Coldest place on Earth. That I mean, would that, just literally frostbite your skin upon impact. You know, I lived in uh, I lived in Colorado once, and I was driving from Vail to Canyon City. And uh, it's a route you have to go through South Park and all that. And we were in a horrible storm, and I was driving. It's like a two-hour trip. And um, I guess if anybody's familiar with the area, you know what I'm talking about. And it was snowing. It was cold. I think it was uh, minus 20 that night. It was the middle of the night. It's dark. And I had no heater core working in my car. And I had these little uh, heat packs in my feet to keep my feet from completely freezing off. But I was uh, as I was making this trip, it was so cold, and I had no heat in the car. It literally felt like my eyeballs were freezing, and I, I couldn't even imagine what minus 128 would do to your eyeballs. I mean, that's something yeah, you, you don't really think about, but but that's you, that's you gotta cold. wear full gear. You oh, got yeah, you gotta have a single millimeter of your skin that could be exposed. No, uh, for those wondering, Minnesota has uh, International Falls, which frequently records temperature. It's called the ice box uh, of the country, at least. It's uh. We had record we had record colds in Minnesota for what was two years ago. The actual temperature we hit twenty below zero plus wind chill all the time. I mean, like actual temperature twenty below zero, but we hit a couple of years ago thirty three to forty below zero actual temperature for ten days, and then we had wind chill on top of that. So it was one of those you could throw buckets of water in the air and watch it freeze instantly. But that was when Minnesotans actually went. Well, it's really cold out, but that was 33 to 40 below plus plus extra wind chill on top of it. And so it wasn't go walk around the lake weather, but there are people, you know, you can adapt to a point. But then, like Brad's saying, you have to be in full gear. It's like being in scuba diving, except you're not underwater. you you got to have a full face gear. And, you know, this is not dog sled weather at 100 below zero. Yeah, definitely oh, you can not. die. 
You could die. You'd have, you'd have doxicles. <laughs> doxicles. <laughs> I think it's important that we go back, though. It's important that we, uh, I think uh, I'm open to anyone. I don't, I, I, I know that Brad has been there, but I, I, my intent was to go back and film and, of course, produce it for the world and everyone to see. But the, it's not that, um, this is not something that people are commonly going and doing. And I don't want to just touch the continent. I do want to get uh, as far as we can in a direction that we think it would be the most useful for an initial expedition, whether it's to the pyramid or whether it's to a ground location that is open for exploration, I think it's it behooves us to go. And I think it's money well spent for those that can, you know, buy Bitcoin. You know, Jared, I, I actually <laughs> thought I thought maybe I'd go with you, but 128, man, no way. No way. We don't have to go out. You know, you, you're going to want to wear I, more than your North I Face jacket. There's just no way for me to even imagine what 100 minus 128 degrees feels like just for a well, second. Well, it's 60 below times two, and 60 below is already too cold. And I've never been I mean, in that. <laughs> oh, it, that one's easy, actually, believe it or not. Just just don't, like, I'm walking in and out of, like, uh, the local grocery store getting my favorite espresso drink and flip-flops. No joke. Yeah, I've been in minus and, 40. I've done that. That's um, cold. But I don't know, Brad, what, what do you think? I mean, this is in all seriousness, what, what do you think realistically, if you were going to go back and, and, and we had it budgeted, what direction would you go on the continent? Oh, I, I'm talking to a film crew and we already had some initial plans with a production company in LA to go last year uh, at the end of 2020. But of course, COVID hit early in the year and we had to call that off uh back in well this time a year ago and then we're budgeting it to go through south africa where i wanted proposing we do the most bang for our buck would be in the new schwabenland area so again thinking in terms of a, a tv series how many episodes you could do it would be the bases that are still there including now they're not West German anymore. They're just German bases. They're still there. The Germans have never left New Schwabenland. That's what people uh, need to understand. It's not on the maps anymore. It's called Queen Maud Land. But I'd go there and I would try to get the permission uh, to go explore the mountainous region around the Schumacher Ponds, which is where the expedition party first landed after they realized that there were some lakes there that never froze over. So the Germans went in, they flew off the ship called New Schwabia, and they had a seaplane and landed on the Schumacher Ponds, named after the captain, who stayed behind with the boat and was conducting some experiments and finding out that uh, the heat was coming from below. So they were geothermal lakes. And his expedition party left from there on about a, a one-week initial exploration they did find entrance into some of these under ice areas and in my book beyond esoteric i reproduce two maps one of the german new schwabenland claim itself uh one of the original german maps from that trip and then another one showing how the u-boats would go underneath the ice and in my talk uh the hidden anomalies of antarctica which i'll be giving this Saturday at the 5D conference in Vegas, I show uh, Antarctica without the ice. And there are these long fjords, some of them that'll extend for hundreds of miles. And if you had an intrepid enough crew with some of the U-boat technology that the Germans had in World War II, you could go explore via submarine under the ice into some of these fjords and occasionally pop up and see some of these domes under the ice that no human has ever seen before. So the presumption is they were in touch even before World War II with ET civilizations. And this starts with the Vril Society shortly after World War I. And they had some mediums, Sagril and Maria Orsic, who wore their hair very long in a barbarian hunting lodge and were telepathic. And they were, the Vril Society was, was getting these downloads uh, and they were able to put them 
pen to paper and create blueprints with it. So this was then absurd by the Nazis who were in the Thule Society, another secret society that was very much into the ancestral roots of the German people, but also this, they called it techno-magical abilities of our space brothers. Now, they were in touch with some good ones and then also some bad ones. Uh, ultimately, they made the same mistake the U.S. did and allied with the bad ones. We did it under the Griotta Treaty, technology exchange for allowing these service to self ETs do the abductions and to uh, cattle mutilate under the cover of not being confronted by our military. That's a whole other interview we can go into. But how it relates to the Germans, they too turn to the dark side and some of these malevolent ET groups, including the reptilians. And that is who either provided them the technology that the Germans were perfectly capable of backward engineering and working through these blueprints to create their own craft, or they were allied with the reptilians. And that was the craft that come out of the water during the Battle of High Jump which sliced the USS Murdoch in half. Some great data points for all the high jump and the Battle of High Jump comes from no, none other than the former Soviet Union. So right when the, the Berlin Wall came down and uh, all the European, Eastern European countries started to demand their own sovereignty, and then soon the Soviet Union fell. Remember when Yeltsin was up on the tank well, his soldiers, those soldiers that were there, some politician like him jumping up on the tank and saying, we got a new government, it had every right to turn the gun and shoot him dead. But they didn't. And that was the turning point. So Russia was broke, right? Or it was a kleptocracy. Everybody was stealing everything they could. You could show up in Moscow in 1991 with a suitcase full of hard currency or gold or something exchangeable, and they would go right into the KGB office and get you whatever you wanted. And eventually all their information on Antarctica and high jump came out. This is some of the, one of the best repositories of information in the 1990s came out of the former Soviet Union, including this ship that came out of the ice that sliced the Murdoch in half. The Russians knew about it because they were spying on us just like we were spying on them and probably a little, Schottenfreuden took a little pleasure or delight in the misfortune of their uh, Cold War adversary to see us get our butt handed to us. All right. And the U.S. lost that battle. I have I have a couple questions. So we know for sure that the Murdoch was lost, right? That's there was a ship destroyed and it's been called the Murdoch. Now, get this. The Murdoch was also the ship that was fired upon in the Gulf of Tonkin incident. But the. U.S. has a way of uh, using the same name for ships. Like, they'll do that, and they'll throw off your enemy. The Germans did it, too, with their U-boats. They'll say that a certain uh, ship has been sunk, but in actuality, it never was, or vice versa. All right. A ship really does get sunk, but it has a dubious history to look up, and, and I have looked it up many times. Some will have it in the high jump expeditions. Others will not that it's kind of a disappeared entity. All right, and Hot Sauce with a super, ch a super chat. Thanks again. He asked, or she, I, I, I suppose, whatever Hot Sauce is, and uh, are weapons allowed on uh, the island just in case we run into reptilians in an underground cave? Can you, can you bring a weapon with you? <laughs> well, per the Antarctica Treaty, there is no military exercises or uh, shooting like that. Now, I think for reasons of self-defense and there are some seals that could potentially take a bite out of you or maybe you could bring one in i'm sure we could have had one on our boat that i didn't even know about and you could have smuggled it on it, it wasn't they weren't inspecting us real closely in fact i know i could have brought one in my bag i could yeah, have like had it if you had to check my backpack if you had yeah. a 45 or something i mean it could have been in your backpack yeah. the whole time right you didn't have to go totally. through any Metal detectors or anything? Nope. nope. All right, that's interesting. Uh, well, I mean, we're we're running short. Jared, do you want to? Uh, do you have anything to say oh, before we? You know, well, I think this was just great because this is the kind of stuff people want to hear about. They always want to, you know, they 
I, I've been recommending to a lot of people to go to conference or go to events. And so first and foremost, I want to thank Brad for coming on. And actually, this is the kind of stuff that when people go, this is like, I can tell you, despite what was said now, I, I've, I've been to some of the big events live, of course. And I think this one coming up, this 5D thing, and I'm sure Brad yeah. can speak on it too, but I have to extra promote that. Anytime you can go to a live event and meet someone who's done the work that Brad's done, they really should go. It's um, it's going to be probably one of the only things this year. And it's just this this kind of in-depth look at what what is a big, interesting topic to everyone. But I think people getting their heads around the fact that, you know what, it might be four or six or eight or 12, depending on how you want to go. But you can go to Antarctica. You can go, hell, you can even go diving. So... Anyway, this is a really good time. And as far as, oh, this is a live chat, so we're not doing a bumper after. So I will add, you can always find me at notaliens.com and co-hosting here with Michael on Conflict. And um, I'll be doing the Forbidden Knowledge News Conference. I'm the keynote on Friday night on April 2nd and speaking on Saturday. And then we have our big trip, Conflict's big trip. We are going to America's Stonehenge at the end of April. And we're going to be there. I'll be putting out some more info. I'll be doing a live um, conference, at least a two or three hour lecture for people if they want to join us at America's Stonehenge and also tour the site that is open and in New Hampshire and we'll get more info out about that. Yeah, and that conference will be broadcast live on Conflict TV official. Uh, you'll find a link for that on our main channel page or just Google it, just Conflict TV. So just to, let's let's just so that we're on the record, everybody, I'm going to go ahead and say that I, I believe that this Admiral Byrd's diary out there, I believe it's fake. And um, I, I don't, I think that it was a, I think it's a book that was put out by his kid. And uh, that's where I stand on that. Jared, you? Yeah, I just, well, I can only say it's hearsay until somebody gets me some providence on the information. That's all. It's just, it's great. It's very interesting, but there's just zero providence on its, or, or its source. It's just, it's just a, it's an interesting dialogue. The ancillary evidence and the things that Brad has discussed in in this whole live event the reality is there is good info to support absolutely something being there but i don't think it's because we lean um yeah, it's on, not based uh, on the diary right. yeah yeah uh brad it's based on you... a few other things yeah brad yeah, there, well there's there's other witness testimony about the inner earth or under the ice hole uh and i didn't really refer to the diary that much but Look, there's forensic ways we could look at it, test the paper for age, compare the handwriting to other known bird handwritings. If this is real and the family possesses it and they're putting this narrative out there, well, it should hold up to scrutiny and some yeah. researchers should be able to uh, test it. That's all. Yeah, it And should. like Jared said, create a providence for it and then it could help us learn and understand or if it's a fake, then just forget it. We'll move on to the next. All right. So, uh, is it? So, what do you think? Is it fake or is it real? For me, the jury's out. I, I need more information. I All need right. to look at it, preferably, uh, and maybe Scott Walter up there in uh, Minnesota, Jared. <laughs> we can get him to look into it. American. Yeah, Oscar, we are. I was on an episode of that once with him. Yeah, yeah. Scott office is about three miles from me. We are friends, and I uh, that that can happen. I think he should be involved. Yeah, we, that suggestion. we need to get him on the show uh, for sure. Well, Brad, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you? Yeah, sure. You want to know more about me and the projects I work on? BradOlson.com. It also has some of the conferences that I have coming up. Most are virtual, including Contact in the Desert. It's a virtual conference this year, end of June. But one of the few live ones is this weekend in Las Vegas at the Westgate Hotel and Conference Center that we'll be in and 5devents.com if you want to check out tickets for that. I think they still are able to sell about 40 or 50 more. Uh, there are limits. It's kind of every other person now. But uh, great lineup of people. And if you want to know more about my books, cccpublishing.com and my latest book, Beyond Esoteric Escaping Prison Planet, has just come out. Doing a lot of interviews in support of that book. And uh, that has all the, the more recent Antarctica information, including the black goo, which we didn't even talk about, and other weird 
things about that southern continent. And the black goo, but, we're going to have to get into that into the after show a little bit, probably. All right, we'll do that. You got me curious. All right, guys. Well, that's going to do it for us. Remember, you can always find us online. Just go to www dot conflict radio dot net you can always find us there and remember you can always find us on apple itunes and spreaker and all of your normal podcast catchers we're setting up a members only area on the youtube channel that will be available i guess uh within the next couple days in fact brad and jared are both going to stick around and we're going to do a little after show that's going to be available only to our subscribers where we talk about black goo and i also want to talk to you brad about a little bit about um, the trip that all of these elites went on a few years ago down there, and where they could have possibly have gone, and where I've where I have heard that they may have gone, and uh, we'll see what you think about that. And uh, I guess that's going to do it for us. Make sure to check out our swag and uh, the store there on the YouTube channel and on the website. And uh, be safe, everyone. Batten down the hatches. Take it easy. <laughs>